Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. Um, I'm with the Valley 9-11 Truth Group and also with Flyby News. And we've been having events here uh, since 2006, mostly regarding 9-11 and uh, trying to engage people with things that a lot of people might not want to know about. And uh, after the 10th anniversary of 9-11, uh, myself and Flyby News, we decided, well, we have to start connecting the dots. And so we started looking at related events that uh, are connected. And I produced a film compilation called JFK and the Fed, Dark Legacy, and includes uh, the, one of the major conspiracies of our times. Uh, and then I was planning on doing something on November 22nd, uh, which is the 50th anniversary of JFK's assassination. And I heard from a friend about this book, Mary's Mosaic. So I decided to get it from the library. I read it. I was blown away. And, and then I was contacted Peter Janney to ask him if he could make it here for uh, November 22nd. And uh, he said, well, he's going to be most likely uh, uh, maybe going to Dallas or other venues. But, um, but I said, well, I reserved this space for April 11th uh, just in case we needed it, being the uh, anniversary of uh, Chavez, uh, the failed coup d'etat in Venezuela and having Chavez die recently. But again, we've shown that film plenty of times, and, and so that never happened. And then we decided, well, let's do it here. And so I'm really glad that people came out in the short notice. Uh, there'll be another event. Chris Pratt's here. He's going to be um, having Peter Janney come to either Burlington or Brattleboro in June. And uh, if you keep in touch with his website, deceptionsusa.com, you get a lot of good information there, and, and he'll keep you updated. Uh, flybynews.com, again, if you want to see my films. <clears throat> I was able to interview Peter Janney at the uh, community television station in Greenfield, and John's here a recording for Northampton Community TV. So it looks like um, we're going to have a good production crew working on this and trying to spread this information out. So I don't want to take much more time because this is a very fascinating program and it's going to be a Q&A at the end. So let me just introduce of really what be, who's becoming a really dear friend and a uh, truth teller on this issue of uh, Mary Pinchot Meyer, John F. Kennedy, and the vision for world peace. Peter Janney. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I've got really a, a two-part presentation for you this evening. I want to say a few things, uh, go through kind of a little uh, oral presentation. Uh, and then I want to tell you what has happened since this book came out exactly one year ago. There's been some very fascinating and intriguing new development uh, in the Mary Meyer murder, and which uh, my publisher has decided that he's going to publish a second edition of this book, and it'll be out in September with a new postscript chapter uh, that I'm currently uh, trying to finish uh, right now. So I also want to, at the end of the presentation, which is going to take between about 35 minutes, no more than 40, I hope, I want to really give all of you a chance to ask questions, to make comments, um, to uh, among yourselves, uh, honor the fact that you're American citizens and that uh, by some appearances it, it, it looks like we're kind of losing our country to what John Perkins calls the corporatocracy. And I want to ha have each of us have a chance to talk about what that's like and what we can do collectively as well as individually to uh, take our country back. So let me just begin by saying that, you know, as a clinical psychologist by profession, um, I came to this subject matter from a very personal disposition. Having known Mary Pinchot Meyer as a young boy, I was best friends uh, with her middle child, Michael, who was killed in an accident, a car accident, when we were both nine years old. Now, all of what I'm saying, excuse me, is in the book. And just let me have a show of hands of how many people have actually read the book right now. 
Okay. Halfway through it. Halfway through it. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm going to be a little coy with some of my remarks because I don't want to spoil it for you. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a real adventure, I think, in reading this book, and it really will take you uh, someplace. And it, it's, a, in many ways, a delightful read, and I don't want to ruin it for anyone. However... I'll probably make some mistakes, and you'll and say at the end of the thing, "Oh, I wish he didn't say that." Now I know what's going to happen. But I'll be uh, I'll be as coy as I can with this. I want to just begin by saying that it's important for all of us to realize that we in the United States are less than five percent of the world's population. Yet we are consuming today over 25% of the world's resources and producing over 30% of the world's pollution. That's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for any other country on, on the globe. It's not sustainable for America. We've got to come to grips with what kind of a society and culture we are if we're going to be able to maintain a sustainable planet for our children, for our future, for our grandchildren. I ask myself many times, my God, how did we get here? And one of the things that I come face to face with as a student of history is that America's untold history, America's hidden history, has haunted me Uh, for a very long time. Uh, I've been growing up, I was increasingly agitated uh, by what was taking place in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. Having a father who just happened to be, make a career out of being a very high official in the Central Intelligence Agency further compounded my personal predicament. Into that mix were the added ingredients of his alcoholism and arrogance and the kind of self-perpetuating narcissism that by definition never allowed for any real self-examination or accountability. It was here that I came to realize that historical truth is the ultimate navigational lighthouse which should guide humankind when we grope for an accurate diagnosis in any crisis. Without it, Any real understanding is impossible, which ultimately means that we are destined to repeat the same mistakes over and over again, whether on a personal or national level. A true healing or reckoning can only take place in an atmosphere where truth and the pursuit of truth is allowed to reign supreme. And yet we must remember that there are limits of any historical account. For with history, we are always dealing with fragments of evidence. What comes down to us from the past is very often a small fraction of what actually really took place. And that fraction tends to represent the interests of the privileged classes, since they were the only ones through human history who knew how to write, knew how to keep records. That immediately sets up a bias, simply in terms of the evidence, a historian's values, both buried and conscious, though not necessarily made explicit, in addition to the incomplete nature of surviving fragmented historical evidence, always in the ends, stands in the way of a fully dispassionate and intact reproduction of the past. Every piece of written history is therefore ultimately subjective at some level, because there's no such thing as true objectivity, given the laws of quantum mechanics and physics. While historical accuracy and objectivity must always remain the historian's holy grail, it can only be approximated and never really consummated. Still, there is much good historian, a historian can achieve, particularly by exposing those facts that any society tends to hide about itself, facts about wealth and poverty, tyranny and lies, and then, of course, assassinations and murder. In part... This is precisely what the former military intelligence officer and Cold War historian L. Fletcher Prouty was referring to when he warned us that one of the greatest casualties of the Cold War of the 1950s and 1960s had been the truth itself. At no time in our history has the general public been so misled 
so betrayed as it was in the last half of the 20th century by the work of the propaganda merchants and their so-called historians. For this is how America's fledging experiment in democracy became eviscerated. Remember that it was Fletcher Prouty who Oliver Stone based his character of Mr. X in his film JFK. Therein lies the cancerous tumor upon the soul of America. The CIA's inception and entrance into the American landscape fundamentally altered not only the functioning of our government, but our access to the real truth of what actually took place. Simply put, the CIA's reign has contaminated the pursuit of historical truth. While the dismantling of America's Republic didn't begin in Dallas in 1963, that day surely marked an unprecedented acceleration of the erosion of our democratic republic. I believe we've never recovered. 25 years later, at the end of the Iran-Contra affair in 1987, which should have resulted in the impeachment of Ronald Reagan, the late Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii made the following statement at the end of the congressional hearings. Quote, There exists a shadowy government with its own air force, its own navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interests, free from all checks and balances and free from the law itself. Two years earlier, in 1985, attorney Mark Ling, probably the greatest living fighter for the truth of how the CIA had orchestrated the Kennedy assassination, successfully defended the organization known as Liberty Lobby in a retrial in a libel suit brought by the CIA's own E. Howard Hunt. Attorney Lane, in front of an entire courtroom, was able to finally expose Howard Hunt on the witness stand for the pathological liar that he was. Hunt, it turns out, had been in fact in Dallas on the day of the assassination, acting as one of the paymasters for the conspiracy that assassinated our president. At the end of the trial, Jury for woman Leslie Armstrong said the following to what little media presence was there at the conclusion of the trial. Quote, the evidence was clear. The CIA had killed President Kennedy. Hunt had been a part of it. And that evidence, so painstakingly presented, should now be examined by the relevant institutions of the United States government so that those responsible for the assassination might be brought to justice. Around the nation, however, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, as well as the rest of the national media completely avoided the story about the jury's verdict, a case where the CIA's role in the president's assassination had been unanimous and conclusive. In his 1996 book, History Will Not Absolve Us, the Boston psychiatrist E. Martin Schatz talks about a scene in a play that he had written 10 years earlier. It is a scene in which Alan Dulles and JFK confront each other in the afterlife. Dulles insists that he was the true upholder of American values and that out of his patriotic duty had President Kennedy killed. The two argue back and forth, and finally Dulles says, look, Jack, suppose you had a stroke and died in Daly Plaza that day instead of being shot. Would the history of the United States be any different? We didn't take over the government. We just shot you. Dulles' fictional claim in the play, as it turns out, was quite accurate. He and the CIA didn't have to take over the government because by 1963, they were completely and firmly embedded in it. The CIA reasoned correctly that the balance of forces, which after November 22nd rested on Lyndon Johnson's mantle, would be on its side if Kennedy were eliminated. To this day, the Central Intelligence Agency continues its efforts to cover up its role in the Kennedy assassination. According to author Joan Mellon, a special committee of archivists and librarians at the National Archives was convened in the year 2000 to examine a set of sealed records, some believe as many as 50,000 pages of documents relating to the Kennedy assassination in order to determine whether they should be released to the public. However, Before any determination could be made, 
the group was visited by a man identifying himself as a representative of the CIA. He warned them that under no circumstances must they ever reveal to anyone what they had viewed in those documents. So chilling had this man's threat been that no one talked. Simply put, when the authority of a government is challenged, that government will do everything in its power to ensure that they are not exposed as the liars and murderers that they are. Let us also not forget that 25 years earlier in 1975, Senator Richard Schweiker of Pennsylvania, half of a two-man subcommittee within the Senate Church Committee, authorized to investigate the Kennedy assassination, had viewed some of these very same yet unseen classified documents at the National Archives, and he came to the following conclusion. Quote, We don't know what happened in Dallas, but we do know that Oswald had intelligence connections. Every, everywhere you look with him, there are the fingerprints of intelligence. In 2007, referring to Oswald's 1959 phony defection to Russia, Schweitzer told author David Talbot that the ex-Marine Oswald was a product of a fake defector program run by the CIA. Schweiker was never convinced at any time that the CIA ever came clean about what it really knew. Again, let us not also forget that the Congressional House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded their three-year investigation in 1979 with a probable finding of a probable conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination, Remembering, re recommending that the Department of Justice investigate further. Nothing, of course, took place, except that the most sensitive, most revealing files uncovered by the House Committee have been, quote, lawfully locked away until the year 2029. The tapestry of President Kennedy's killing is enormous. The tapestry of the subject of my book, Mary Myers, is much smaller, and yet they are connected one to the other in ways that became increasingly apparent to me as I dug ever more deeply into her relationship with the president and the circumstances surrounding her own demise to understand the complex weave of elements that led to her death is to understand in a deeper way one of the most abominable, despicable events in all of American history. So let me just give you the Cliff Notes version of why President Kennedy was assassinated. President Kennedy ran not only afoul of the CIA, but the Pentagon, the Texas oil barons, and the entire banking system behind the Federal Reserve. He was departing from the Cold War script in his dealings with Russia because he and Khrushchev, after the Cuban Missile Crisis in late 1962, had become partners in the pursuit of world peace. In June 1963, at his American University commencement address, the president announced his intention of creating the first nuclear arms test ban treaty with the Soviets, unbeknownst to the CIA and the Pentagon. Equally groundbreaking was the speed with which the treaty would be drafted and then ratified. The moment had to be seized quickly. Kennedy asked Averill Harriman to lead the American team, but it was the president himself who prepared them, making sure they understood the critical importance of what was about to occur. They were all sworn to secrecy. Once Harriman arrived in Moscow on July 14th, Kennedy would be in contact with him three or four times a day. Spending hours in the cramped White House Situation Room, Kennedy personally edited the U.S. position as if he were at the table himself. The Soviets were astonished when they realized that the American president had the power to make decisions on a matter like this without consulting any bureaucracy. That was only because Kennedy had taken matters into his own hands. He well knew that such a treaty would never occur had he worked through the national security channels of the CIA and the Pentagon. On July 25th, just six weeks after his American University address of June 10th, Averill Harriman put his initials on the first limited nuclear test ban treaty in Moscow. It would be ratified by the U.S. Senate that September, September 24th, 1963, ironically, the same day that President Kennedy and Mary Pinchot Meyer would stroll the grounds of Mary's family estate, known as Gray Towers in Milford, Pennsylvania, where the president was dedicating the Pinchot Institute 
for conservation studies. Kennedy was also going to normalize relations with Castro in Cuba. He was clearly going to extricate the United States out of Vietnam and Southeast Asia, as his National Security Action Memo 263 in the fall of 1963 had outlined. He wanted to make changes to the Federal Reserve, giving back to the U.S. Treasury its rightful power to control U.S. currency. He wanted to create a joint venture with the Soviets to go to the moon together, most threatening, however, was the fact that he planned to neuter the CIA after he was re-elected in 1964 by taking away their capacity to conduct most of their covert military actions. All of what I'm saying to you right now isn't a theory. It is based now on historical, factual events that were taking place in 1963. JFK was no longer willing to be a pawn of the national security apparatus, the Cuban Missile Crisis had changed everything. Whether you believe that President Kennedy and Mary Meyer possibly took a mild psychedelic journey together in May of 1963 isn't ultimately important. What is important was that increasingly Kennedy saw the futility of the Cold War mentality and his position as the most powerful leader in the world, along with Premier Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union, both men realized that the only worthwhile trajectory was the pursuit of world peace, which they had begun together. Make no mistake about it, this is why President Kennedy was assassinated, and a villain cowboy who was on the very day of JFK's assassination on his way to being criminally indicted was waiting in the wings to take over. Now, as citizens in a democracy all of us have the obligation and responsibility to deal with the events of our time so as to protect the fragile nature of our republic. If a democracy is to survive and flourish, every one of us must find his or her way of making some kind of a contribution. In other words, we must all get active. Even if it is on the local level in a limited enterprise, we must be able to associate ourselves with the issues that are impacting our life today. It isn't enough anymore to just be a professional, to work hard, to raise a family, whatever our circumstances. We simply must find some time to devote ourselves to public affairs, which inevitably means becoming political. Because when people act collectively, rather than just on an individual basis, we are more likely to get a cha change in policy. And when people unite in sufficient numbers, they really can make a difference. We have only to remember in our lifetime what the anti-war movement did in the, in the late 1960s and 70s to end the Vietnam War. So with the publication of Mary's Mosaic last year in April, I mistakenly thought that this piece of work might come to some conclusion, that I might embark on some other journey, maybe even having the opportunity of falling in love again or at least stopping to smell the scent of lilacs in spring. I was wrong. My own duty as a citizen uh, in our democratic republic, or what's left of it, has only become even more important because the stakes for our most precious commodity, historical truth, have never been higher at this very moment, given what took place in the last year after this book was published. Let me just say that at the end of this part of my presentation, there is a scene in Oliver Stone's film, JFK, where at the end of the trial, Jim Garrison is facing the jury in his final summation. And he says the following to the jury. Do not forget your dying king. Show this world that this is still a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Nothing as long as you live will ever be more important. It's up to you. Now, that's my introduction by way of what I want to get into now because, as I mentioned, I want to talk to you about what's happened after this book came out. It's taken me totally by surprise, but it's critically important, and I'm going to tell you why. As most of you are beginning to understand or have begun to understand, Mary Pinchot Meyer's self-possession 
was always a hallmark of her character. However overwhelmed she might have been by the vast implications of what had occurred in Dallas, not only for herself but for the world at large, her temperament and moral rectitude demanded at the very least she attempt to make sense of what took place. What better way to cope with the enormity of that task than to set aside periods of time for reflection, aided by the valuable tools she had utilized effectively in the past. Neither a recluse nor one to be intimidated by authority, Mary wanted to understand what had taken place. The sheer magnitude of her lover's assassination had catapulted her through endless shock waves, eventually forcing her to recognize the enormity of what had occurred. Not only the events in Dallas, but the subsequent cover-up that was taking place right before her eyes. This cover-up, in fact, as some of you already know, is the subject of the later chapter in my book. Quote, They couldn't control him anymore, Mary sobbed on the telephone with Timothy Leary sometime in early December 1963, just after the assassination. He was changing too fast. They've covered everything up. I've got to come and see you, but I'm afraid. Be careful. Determined to understand and unravel what was taking place, she confronted what amounted to be a mysterious jigsaw mosaic, which in the end she would come to understand and realize what in fact was taking place. However, as we know, it would cost her her life. Now, as some of you already know, the man prosecuted for the crime of Mary Meyer's murder was a man by the name of Raymond Crump, but he was acquitted at the trial nine months after the murder in July of 1965. He was clearly being railroaded for a crime he could never have committed. The prosecution illegally withheld evidence that would have most likely exonerated Crump had he been allowed to have a preliminary hearing. Specifically, the FBI crime report, completed two days after the murder, was withheld from the defense until the beginning of the trial. The report could not find any forensic evidence whatsoever linking Mr. Crump to Mary Meyer's murder or the crime scene. Mary Meyer was shot twice with a 38 caliber pistol at close range. The killing had all the markings of a skilled professional assassin. The first shot traversed her skull from left to right. The second shot just below her right shoulder blade angled slightly to the left thereby severing her aorta and killing her instantly. Ray Crump had never even owned a gun in 1964. No one in his family or his community had ever seen him with a firearm of any kind. Crump's defense attorney, the legendary Debbie Roundtree, was the first African-American woman to be admitted to the D.C. bar. Without any financial remuneration and using her own resources, Attorney Roundtree would stake her entire professional life on defending a victimized, dirt-poor young black man. It wasn't just the life and future of one man that was at stake, however. She believed Crump was being conveniently scapegoated. Justice itself was on trial. And if the cause of justice was was to be served, then everything in its way had to be confronted and overcome. The brazen manner with which this crime was set up and then committed was an extraordinary as it was jaw-dropping. Tow truck driver Henry Wiggins Jr. and his partner Bill Branch had been called to fix a stalled Nash Rambler located in the 4300 block of Canal Road. The car had been ostensibly stranded on a soft shoulder exactly diagonally across from the towpath of the C&O Canal where Mary Meyer was taking her usual walk after a morning of painting at her art studio. Literally less than one minute after the tow truck arrived, Henry Wiggins began to hear screams coming from the canal towpath from across the canal road. The screams lasted for 20 seconds. Wiggins would estimate to police that the woman was pleading, somebody help me, help me, somebody help me. A gunshot then rang out from the same direction as the shouting. The time was 12.21 p.m. on Monday, October 12, 1964. 
Now, Henry Wiggins was a heavyset 24-year-old black man who had served in the Army and the military police unit in Korea, and he was still fast on his feet. On hearing the shot, he had dashed across Canal Road toward the stone wall at the edge of the embankment overlooking the canal. Seconds before he got there, he heard a second shot. When he peered over the wall down across the canal, Wiggins saw a man, quote, a Negro male standing over a woman who lay motionless and curled on her side. Minutes later, Wiggins would give police a description of the man, recorded on the department's police form PD-251. The, quote, Negro male was listed as having a medium build, 5 feet 8 inches to 5 feet 10 inches, and weighing 185 pounds. Also listed were the clothes Wiggins said the man was wearing, a dark plaid cap, a light beige colored waist-length zipper jacket, dark trousers, and dark shoes. While Ray Crump was wearing a similar set of clothes that day, his driver's license listed him as a slight five five feet three and a half inches tall, weighing 130 pounds. Police would later measure the distance from where Wiggins stood at the wall to the murder scene to be 128 feet. It was close enough to make out specific details, certainly close enough to see that the woman was white, the man standing over her black, and that he stood with his hands down at his sides. Wiggins said, quote, he was facing toward me, but his head was bent down. He was looking at the body on the ground. Then he looked up toward the wall where I was standing. He saw me. I was looking right at him. Wiggins ducked behind the wall. But when he peeked back over, it, he saw the man held some kind of a dark object in his right hand. From the considerable distance of 128.6 feet, he couldn't say with certainty what the object was. But given the gunshots he had just heard, he assumed it was a gun. Quote, he just shoved something in his jacket pocket, looked at me for a couple of seconds, turned away from the victim and walked, not ran, walked down over the embankment. Wiggins couldn't say which way the man went after he disappeared over the embankment. But nowhere in Wiggins' initial description to police or in his testimony nine months later at the trial did he ever mention seeing any stains, blood, or anything else on the fully zipped, light-colored beige jacket the man had been wearing. Indeed, the, quote, Negro male in his clothes which Wiggins had described appeared to be neatly in place, Nothing was disheveled. There was, in contrast to what police would later describe as a very bloody crime scene, where the assailant had struggled and then dragged Mary Meyer's body some 25 feet in order order to position her in clear view at the edge of the CNO Canal. Meanwhile, the stalled Nash Rambler mysteriously disappears within an hour and a half after the police arrive on the scene, not having been repaired either by Wiggins or his assistant, Bill Branch. The repair ticket for the car is never located, and the owner of the vehicle still remains unknown today. The day after the murder, newspaper headlines now headlining the murder and the victim's identity, a new twist designed to further implicate the framing of Ray Crump begins to take place. Army Lieutenant William L. Mitchell shows up at police headquarters and states that he had been running along the towpath the preceding day and believes that he had passed the murdered woman, then adding that a Negro male matching Ray Crump's clothing and description had been following her. Police seize upon this information to further bolster their case against Crump, in spite of the fact that there is no forensic evidence linking Crump to the crime scene or Mary Meyer. When Mitchell shows up for the trial in July of 1965, just nine months later, he is allegedly no longer in the Army and tells one newspaper reporter that he is now teaching at Georgetown University. Yet in 1990, Georgetown University tells one author, his name is Leo Damore, who was really the first author to do the groundbreaking work of solving this murder, says that there is no record of any William L. Mitchell ever having taught at Georgetown. This was reconfirmed by me in 2005. 
In his testimony at trial, Mitchell attempts to frame Ray Crump as the man he saw following Mary Meyer. But Crump is acquitted for lack of evidence. During the years of 1990 to 1993, author Leo DeMoor searched far and wide for William Mitchell, but could never locate him. Both DeMoor and defense attorney W. Roundtree had independently come to the conclusion that Mitchell's presence in the Meyer murder was highly suspicious. In his research, DeMoor talked to two former CIA people who said that Mitchell's address, an apartment complex known as the Virginian, which was located at 1500 Arlington Boulevard in Arlington, Virginia, was a known CIA safe house. I reconfirmed this piece of evidence with two additional former CIA people in 2006. Finally, DeMoor, out of frustration, wrote Mitchell a letter at the end of 1992 and sent it to his last known address, the CIA safe house address. That allegedly sparked a telephone conversation between the two at the end of March in 1993, where Mitchell told DeMoor how Mary Meyer had been murdered in what he termed was a CIA operation. Despite many years of searching, it was not until last summer that the trail of William L. Mitchell, this is August 2012 now, had become known. I promptly brought this information to my chief intelligence researcher, Roger Charles, who enlisted the support of another Pulitzer-nominated investigative reporter by the name of Don Devereaux. What we uncovered was that William L. Mitchell entered Cornell University in the fall of 1957 as a freshman in a five-year undergraduate program for the Bachelor's of Mechanical Engineering degree. However, he conveniently eludes any picture of himself in any of the Cornell yearbooks except one obscure journal in the spring of 1962 in Cornell's Sibley College of Engineering. And this is the only picture of Mr. Mitchell at Cornell that I was ever able to locate, number 76 there. If Mitchell was part of the intelligence world, how was he likely recruited? We can begin to understand part of this process from Robert Gates, who rose from the ranks to assume the position of director of central intelligence and then went on to become secretary of defense. Gates was recruited into the CIA while he was a graduate student at Indiana University, yet he was given no draft deferment by the CIA CIA, and would enter the U.S. Air Force under, quote, CIA sponsorship. William Mitchell graduates from Cornell in 1962 after having been designated as a distinguished military student in Cornell's Army ROTC program, but surprisingly, None of the Army registers from 1962 to 1967 list any William L. Mitchell as a commissioned officer. Moreover, the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis told us in 2005 that they had no record of any William L. Mitchell working at the Pentagon in 1964. It appears that Mitchell may have gone straight into the CIA using the military as a cover. In one academic citation, Mitchell Mitchell lists himself as a 1965-66 Fulbright Scholar at the University of London. At the same time, he is listed in the Department of Defense Directory all through 1965. Yet the Fulbright archives have no record of any William L. Mitchell as a Fulbright participant for this institution. Since August last summer, 2012, we submitted two new FOIA requests for Mitchell service record at the National Personnel Records Center. Yet the center keeps maintaining that it has not received our requests. Is this a coincidence? Or has Mitchell's record been conveniently removed or flagged? Who else was working in Mitchell's DATCOM office, office block, with the office address of BE 1035. Well, it turns out that a man by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Heller Cruikshank was the designated commander of this unit, and his record, which we were able to procure, is littered with intelligence assignments. 
While Cruikshank is identified as an automated data processing officer, in fact, a geek who doesn't even have a college degree, he is clearly running dual tracks in his Army career, one as an intelligence operative and one as a data processing systems analyst. And on September 1, 1964, just six weeks before Mary Meyer is murdered, he becomes chief of the Army War Room Support Division in the Pentagon Statcom office, where he is listed at the same address as William L. Mitchell. Three weeks ago, my chief researcher, Roger Charles, con contacted Cruikshank's two remaining sons, both of whom refused to talk about their father's military career. Mitchell shows up at the University of California at Berkeley, where in 1970 he earns a Ph.D. degree in mathematics, confirmed by the university registrar in sept last September. He then becomes an assistant professor in the business school at California State University Hayward for the 1972-73 academic year, though he may have taught courses there as early as 1969. Rising to the rank of associate professor, his last listing on the faculty is for the 1989-90 academic year, at which time he becomes emeritus. In September of 2012, Cal State East Bay reference librarian Paul McClellan identified Mitchell to us as William L. Mitchell in his initial role as an assistant professor for the 72-73 academic year. He then confirmed that in 1974, for some unknown reason, Mitchell started using the name just Bill Mitchell. Why? Why would he have done that? Well, think for a minute. It turns out that the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Intelligence, run by Senator Frank Church, starts its investigation in 1974 with published reports beginning to appear in 1975. Clearly, Mitchell does not want to be found. Be found. This was followed by a more thorough investigation, as many of us know, conducted by the United States, the House of Representatives Select Committee on Assassinations in 1976. Did Mitchell, or whoever he worked for, fear an investigation into the murder of Mary Pinchot Meyer by Congress that same year? Clearly, Mitchell does not want to be found. Mr. Mitchell continues to attempt to camouflage his identity and whereabouts. His initial Social Security number was issued in New York, but in California he uses a different Social Security number. He purchases residential property under the name of Bill Mitchell in 1978 and then transfers his property into a trust which he owns. His emeritus listing at the University of California is clear. Not William L. Mitchell, but just Bill Mitchell. Is William L. Mitchell still alive? If so, where is he? Last summer, we pinpointed and located him in Northern California. So on August 27 in the afternoon, I went to Mitchell's residence and knocked on his door. This is what took place. Mr. Mitchell? Um, my name is Peter Jenny. I'm an author. Uh, I wrote this book called Mary's Mosaic. I'm not in this. Yeah, I'm in. See you later. Can I just talk off? I came from Boston. I don't care. I'm not in this. See you later. <laughs> Mitchell's physical appearance was at odds with his 70 plus years of age. He was lean and trim, sporting a medium beard and that covered most of his face. His paranoid demeanor communicated a frightened, fearful countenance of having been located and found out. Later that day, I went to the local post, post office and sent Mr. Mitchell a copy of Mary's Mosaic with a cover letter asking him to please reconsider talking with me. There's been no response, of course, but after a number of attempts to connect his brother, James Mitchell, who, is, who, who my researcher Don Devereaux located, we received a hostile telephone call saying that James would not be commenting on this matter and did not want to be contacted again.
Last October, and then recently in, in January of this year, Roger, Charles, and I have met with two senior detectives from the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Force. One of the detectives had already read my book and was very intrigued by it. We disclosed to the police that shortly after the publication of Mary's Mosaic in April, a copy of the book and a cover letter had been sent to every member of both the House and Senate Judiciary Committee, but no member of the judiciary has ever responded. Indeed, the book has been blacked out by all Washington media outlets. We also presented to the police how Mitchell had perjured himself in his testimony at the Meyer murder trial in 1965. We reviewed how the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis had sent no information on Mitchell in 2005 and how it had recently lost two recent requests made in August of 2012, despite our giving the NPRC Mitchell's date of birth and the first five digits of his Social Security number. So it turns out that the police detective became so intrigued with this that as a law enforcement, he called the NPRC. And of course, whenever law enforcement gets involved with getting a military record from out of St. Louis, they respond immediately. A week later, they called Detective Whalen and said, Detective, we have no record of William L. Mitchell, and you've given us his date of birth, his complete Social Security number, but we can't find any record of this guy. So. Here we are. <clears throat> Here's on the left is the copy of the form letter that was sent to both Mr. Charles and myself, and the response speaks for itself, where they say we have conducted extensive searches of e records and source and alternate records sourced to this center. However, we've been unable to locate any information that would help us verify the veteran's military service. Now, <clears throat> you can see that there's something going on here. Uh, this guy has been a, a, a designated uh, military person, yet there's no record that, that uh, is able to verify uh, this service. Who is he? Where is he, where is he from? What's he doing? So that's really uh, the end of my presentation. I want to stop now and just give you and the audience a chance to uh, make comments, ask questions, uh, say whatever you would like. Yes? Um, I'm wondering, you, you um, brought up early on um, the diary of Mary and uh, it's uh, being um, held by the Truitt family, is that? Uh, if I take your question correctly is, what about the diary? What happened to the diary? Now, I, I don't want to ruin it for those of you who are reading the book, who are about to read the book, but um, there were uh, two diaries. One was called a sketchbook, which uh, people like Ben Bradley and James Angleton of the CIA said really contained nothing. But uh, the sketchbook was a ruse. The real diary contained a lot more information and I think contained... Uh, many, many uh, vignettes of Mary's relationship with President Kennedy, her search for what had happened in Dallas and what she'd been able to put together. And that diary was real. Uh, there is evidence that several people uh, ha saw it and read it, which is in the book. Um, so there's been this subterfuge around the diary to take emphasis away from the fact that Mary did keep a very complete, very involved piece of writing. Yes? You seem like you've uh, had a very uh, active research career and you're very driven. Uh, I have two questions related to that. Obsessive would be the word. How, how do you maintain some of that enthusiasm knowing the, the odds and the barriers that, that you're up against? And number two, how can you uh, best give us advice as to what we should be doing to promote the truth? Well, I, I'll answer the first question, your, your second question first. I, look, each of us has to do what we can within the framework of, of our own lives. Um, everyone has their own individual destiny, and so 
it's up to each of us to figure out what we can do, what we feel passionate about, how to stay positive at a time where the planet and our country is in a very negative place. It's, it's, a, it's a daunting, very challenging task, I think, for each of us. In terms of me personally, um, I, I feel that this is, it, it's so important, particularly now, for people to have as many fragments of historical truth as possible. Without the truth, we, we lose. We, we end up spinning our wheels in sand and making the same mistakes over and over again, never really coming to grips with what the reality, however horrific it's been, uh, has impacted us, e either in our personal lives, even, even as a country. Um, I, I don't think our planet can sustain life if we are continually kept from knowing the truth of what is taking place. And it's just essential. I, I mean, we, we have to have it, no matter how painful it is initially. I'm working with uh, 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 some people that are pulling together a theater project that is based around Jim Douglas's book, JFK and the Unspeakable. We'd like to have it happen in 500 places in, in the country. We're going to launch it the, on the 50th anniversary of JFK's death and anticipate it being uh, possibly a five-year project. And right now it's in the script writing and organizational design phase of things. So. Uh, it's very exciting, it's, it's huge, and uh, we appreciate anybody's help that one wants to get involved. That, that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, demonstration of exactly what I'm talking about in terms of being a citizen and stepping forward and, and taking on something that uh, is passionate about, you know, bringing our country back to the people. And, and for those of you who are interested or want to further your knowledge about the Kennedy assassination. James Douglas's book, JFK and the Unspeakable, in my opinion, is probably the best book ever written about the Kennedy presidency uh, and the assassination combined. It's just brilliantly and painstakingly researched, and uh, I've read it several times. I, 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 I credit Jim Douglas in my acknowledgments for having helped me in so many ways write my own book. Uh, I talked to him several times. He was very helpful to me. I just think he has done a marvelous service to historical truth, and I really recommend that book uh, for any of you who are further interested. Yes? You, you haven't read the book yet, have you? Uh, yeah. You have? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, a, a, as you <clears throat> probably remember, you know, my relationship with my father pretty much ended when I went to college, and I started, you know, demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. And I, I, I had a very contentious relationship with my family as I grew into adulthood. Um, and my mother was furious. My father died when, I'm, when he, in 1979, uh, my mother was furious that I was doing this project, and it took her a long time to accept it, and I think she was really worried toward the end. She just died last October after the book had come out, but she had a very uh, strong case of dementia, so she really couldn't understand what was in the book, though I think she knew that I had come to the conclusion um, that my father w was, was part of Mary Meyer's demise, which he was. Uh, so, um, I didn't have any family support, uh, frankly, um, uh, and I had to go it alone, and it was hard, but it, uh, it helped me grow up, and grow up fast, and uh, helped me learn how important it is to not take no for an answer, and to find a way around any obstacle, and so, you know, here I am. <laughs> Yes, Jonathan. Um, 
Um, I love the uh, the quote that you used in your last uh, chapter in the epilogue about uh, from the Buddha. Uh, along the road to truth, there are two mistakes one can make: not going all the way and not starting. And everybody here, we started, so we just have to go all the way now. And uh, I just want to thank you for your support. Yes. What kind of mainstream media response and also alternative media response is the book uh, received? The the book has uh, been carefully avoided uh, in all of Washington, D.C.'s media, print, uh, television, radio. Uh, It was never reviewed in the New York Times. Um, I did, through some personal connections, got a pretty good spread in the Boston Globe, and then in terms of the alternative press, I really did make a number of impro- uh, inroads. If, if you go on the media page of Mosaic.net, the book's website, um, the Huffington Post ran a really you know, good article about it, and, and that really took it around the world to some degree. And, and that's when the CIA, uh, behind my back, invited me on to CNN and, and tried to trash the book with me on the air. Uh, it, it, it ended up actually backfiring for them and because, you know, I just sold more books. Um, but, you know, that, you can catch that media clip on the website as well. But, um, you know, I was never, I, I was never able, and, and uh, I, I don't know what will happen this year. If I can make the, the kind of media splash I would like in getting the Justice Department to reopen the investigation, I think it could be huge. I think enough people will will start making a ruckus about this uh, that will really do something, and and that's what I'm hoping for. But um, this is the year to do it. This is a really important year because being in the 50th year, the JFK anniversary of the JFK assassination, the issue is up. And and you know there have been many polls that repeatedly say that as much as 80% of our population believes that there was some kind of conspiracy in JFK's assassination. And in spite of the fact that most of the major media channels don't want to talk about it, I I think they're ordered not to, uh, we can't forget that in January of this year, Bobby Kennedy Jr. was on television with Charlie Rose and he said that his father had no faith in the Warren Commission report and, and called it on the air a shoddy piece of craftsmanship. That day, MSNBC jumped on that and started talking about it, but then the story vanished. We didn't hear anything more about it. If you want to communicate with me, you can go to marysmosaic.net. There's, there's, you can contact me uh, through that inter- and that site. I, I try and get back to everyone, and I'll be signing. Thank you. Thank you.